What's up, Artemis? How we doing? I hope you guys are having an awesome day. It's been all right over here. <laughs> we had hail the size of nickels yesterday. That was very exciting. But, anywho. Today we are going to be talking about my new favorite book, The Misinformation Age, How False Beliefs Spread, by Kaylin O'Connor and James Owen Weatherall. Weatherall. So basically, what I went to college for. And so I'm very excited. Today we're going to be talking about the introduction and chapter one. We're going to be doing pretty much like a review of the book as well as a summary. Um, in some instances a review is a summary, but I just want to give it real quick 10 out of 10 gold bloom, 5 stars, literally give it an Emmy award winning. Um, you can probably hear my dog eating right now. Don't mind that. He's a hungry boy. <laughs> Anyways, super really good read. Um, some basic key terms here. We're talking science. We're talking politics. We're talking conformity, truth, polarization. It's, it's all there. It's really, really good. And it's like why the world is bad right now with loads of awesome examples and I'm really excited to get to the first one. So what's the first example? The vegetable lamb of tartary. Tartar sauce. Yeah, this one's funny. Is that supposed to be a picture of it or is it supposed to be a real thing? Because it's not real. No, not at all. Not real. And in the book, it explained it as like an animal in a melon, almost. Yeah. And it's just completely inaccurate. And it was a really great introduction to the book to bring out all of these superfluous, ridiculous, just ridiculous examples. Yeah, it's well, I mean, it was the Dark Ages, so it's, like, literally about the dumbest people I've ever been. Yeah. For, like, how smart they should have been. It's science. Scientists. Can we trust scientists? Who are they working for? And then, who is manipulating what they say after they say it? The author asks, what is our modern day vegetable lamb? And how do we believe them? And how are they spread? This is, this is the, the problem that the book is trying to solve. So the, the thesis, I think. So the parallel example to the vegetable lamb was the Pope endorsing President Trump back in 2016. And what their whole thing was that on Facebook, there was two top presidential, like, articles being spread around Facebook, and it was either a fake one or a true one. Anything can go viral on social media. Recently, there have been internet reports about who the Pope is endorsing for president, but just because it's trending, is it true? The big point of the book is that fake news spreads false beliefs. Yes. And so it's going to keep circling back to this. The authors of the book, O'Connor and Weatherall, in their analogy of scientists, they are just the perfect epitome of what a super rational human would do while still being under the human condition because of like conformity and psychology and all of that disaster. So we, in our everyday lives, have beliefs and evidence that we get from our empirical data, and then we act upon these. 
And so we are scientists in a way. What the book introduction is trying to say on this large and local scale is that scientists for the government do things for us on the local scale. But we all use the same methods. We all use evidence and our beliefs and then like we will update these beliefs with evidence and we'll get to that later, but it's called credence. If we can't trust our own beliefs and we rely on others and scientists who are doing the same for the government who makes decisions and acts and policies and laws on factual knowledge, how do they know anything either? It's, it's basically your big who's he, what's it, epistemological, nothing means anything. <laughs> well, you know, they said this, and I trust that. Like, the FDA says that it's totally fine to use Febreze in your house. and But we're like, no, we're not going to do that. You know, it's about how the industrial people, big business, have to do with the FDA, have to do with the scientists, you know. The scientists have their own bias, and it's, it's all very eloquently written in the book. Obviously. They said, uh, you either question nothing, like an idiot, or you question everything. And then that's when, you know, they said, when you want the good stuff, you, you got to deal with the bad stuff. The next thing that the book brought up was propaganda so. to the classical extent of religious propaganda. But then it also moved on to the more modern governmental and political. industrial and political propaganda. Uh, political is just all up in everybody's faces right now. I know our mailbox straight up is filled with hate this guy, hate the other guy, and it's just like, the why aren't you rooting for fire. yourself? <laughs> One of the big examples was smoking. So what they did was classic, like business, corporate, structure, bull crap. They kept doing more studies, stretching it out, so that they couldn't staple down that cigarettes just are bad and they cause cancer and da-da-da because they were still doing studies. So they couldn't be conclusive because they're still doing... St but they were just dicking around just doing bullcrap studies. And the big emphasis on this whole tobacco strategy was building uncertainty in the science. And it's so like the industry would say, no, that science isn't good enough. We're not gonna do anything yet. Bring us better science. And then they would shoot to the public in their ads and PR and be like, it's not, not healthy. Building uncertainty. It's about making the people question the science, basically. So if you ever want to manipulate science, make them question themselves. Scientists are affected by social circles, just like us, by networks and conformity and trust, just like everyone else. Imagine a scientist worries what the people around them think and what the people who fund their science think. These might just be subconscious pressure, but scientists are biased. It's just almost a fact after reading this book. Like, facts at this point don't exist, but that one I know might just be true. <laughs> Somewhere in the world, let's say somebody knows they're the first scientist to find out tobacco is super bad for you. And somebody in big tobacco is like, well, if I gave you a million dollars, do you think that tobacco would not be that bad for you? And then they're like, I am a poor scientist. 
And then so tobacco's not bad for you for another five years. So like that type of crap. It, the first time you see a real example of that, it just goes out the window. I don't remember where it was, but there was just a single sentence in the book, and it was like, you probably think that fat is really bad for you, but that was the sugar industry. <laughs> so, O'Connor and Weatherall. I don't exactly remember if they said that other people built this computer simulation, or if they did it. And what it was, was that if we have these imaginary scientist ideal humans, will they still be affected by conformity, trust, credence, belief, evidence, on all that jazz? So the introduction ended basically that over the history and years, our social structure has changed in the way that we communicate, get our facts, and how we believe them, if we can believe them, and how all the false beliefs are spreading. So the next is chapter one, what is so this chapter started off pretty hairy with something I hold pretty close to my heart, which is global climate change. In 1985, there was a publication of a paper on ozone down over Antarctica. And these three gentlemen here, um, this is Joe Farman, uh, Brian Gardner, and John Shanklin. They're standing in front of an instrument that measures the total amount of ozone between the surface and space. And what they showed was that the level of ozone was dropping, and it was dropping really fast. And the quality of these data are such that there was no dispute to this. But yeah, NASA, there's like, there's no hole in the ozone. It doesn't exist. But I guess it's like, their data was just wrong. They had outliers where they had an AI built to collect a crazy amount of data and anything below this number doesn't exist. It's not real. Yeah, it's because they were too confident in their science. Na NASA's like, we know how things work. The data was there. They just needed to fix their computer, and then it would work, and then suddenly it did. Their, their numbers matched up to the BAS team, and they fixed all that. But it took so long because the scientists were so convinced of what they thought. The modern parallel that the authors made to this was the Donald Trump administration, the news coming up with the term fake news. This isn't real. You're wrong. We are certain about that. And then they brought up a super old philosopher and his super famous example. Can you trust your senses if you think that the sun will go up? and down every day. Can you trust your senses that there's only white swans? No. There's black swans in Australia. The book used a ridiculous example of eventually the sun will explode. I don't exactly remember Hume using that, but what Hume was basically concluding was that there's a huge problem with induction of our senses and empirical knowledge and without certainty science can always be wrong so yeah that structure is what the authors then introduce and they call it bayes rule and if you're going to follow along with the book you really have to remember because they use bayes rule a number of times but it basically means that calculating 
your beliefs, with your evidence, is your credence. And once you have new evidence, you update your belief. And your credence is basically a percentage between 1 and 0. The next example in the book with the whole problem with science and trusting scientists was by Thomas Kuhn, and that is the scientific revolution and paradigm. Kuhn published a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions that claimed the development of scientific discovery was not linear, but cyclical. Kuhn believed that science was punctuated by revolutions that signaled major shifts in scientific understanding. He claimed that this cycle had a recognizable structure that was characterized by successive periods of normal and extraordinary science. Scientists are all trying to find a new set of rules to move forward with. A revolution is underway. Scientists will then start to develop their experiments, and the next cycle begins. Just like we laugh at scientists who thought vegetable lambs existed, we can't think what we know really works, really exists. You think you know how things are, and then things, a tiny little thing changes, and then the whole fabric of what and how you thought everything worked just comes collapsing down. Uh, another thing that the paradigm included was culture and cultural bias. I will say another little writing critique here. They didn't really differentiate when they stopped talking about Kuhn and when they started talking about their own ideas. So these scientists, they are influenced by methods, the scientific methods they use, their culture, their political views, and then their blind spots. You can't control nature blind spots. I always think you're worthless. That's, the, that's like one of the greatest human instincts, is insecurity. If you're not insecure, you're not a human being. Yeah, if your scientific method is super successful, question that. The last section of chapter one was about acid rain. Acid rain is any form of precipitation with high levels of nitric and sulfuric acids. Most acid rain is caused by human activities. When people burn fossil fuels, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released into the atmosphere. Around the same time, the ozone layer whole happening thing was going on, that acid rain was actually being studied more. And guess what? The shindigs of scientists and politicians started going down again. What happened was that in the 1980s era, the Reagan administration, they put a halt on the science of its dangers happening. Because you know why? Why? Because it's all because of the industry. It's because of big business. The industry. <laughs> Yeah, evidence showed that the acid rain was being caused by coal or some sort of fossil fuels. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'll admit this is a little bit of a drunken book summary and review. But anyways, so you have this team of scientists that were put together by a leader of, you know, people who are experts in acid rain. And what happens is the government crosses off a bunch of names and adds one. One single freaking mole. Like, when you got a group of people who want to do one thing, and then someone who wants to do something completely different. So, what this mole man did 
was delay the scientific research research by an entire year and then some. And when it came to the final report, he wrote this entire chapter pretty much saying F you to all the other scientists completely undermining all of their ideas, saying, I don't think this is worth it. I think anything that's suggested in this book here costs too much money, and the only thing fiscally responsibly certain to do is nothing. I'm sorry. I'm getting too excited, maybe. But, but how much do you need money you already have? That you're like, yeah, let's burn the world down. So, you got this final report with this disgusting chapter by the Mole Man. And none of the scientists will sign off on this. And so what happens? But the government gets their hands on it somehow. And they completely water it the F down, pretty much highlighting the mole man's parts. It don't need fixin'. It's all good. And they added all of the scientists' names without their ever saying them al allowing to. Completely unethical. Handing this off to Congress to go vote and pass a bill and make decisions for the rest of all of the Americans in the entire freaking America. But this happens right now. The book says it perfectly. There are political interferences in science today. To conclude the chapter one, what is truth? The real threat is who manipulate science. And that's really exciting because the way chapter two explains it is beautiful. There's a lot of math and a lot of charts. And it's kind of like if a history, sociology, and math textbook made love. And if you're down for it, put it in the comments. I'd love to, you know. That's the introduction and chapter one of the information age, how false beliefs spread by Kaylin O'Connor and James Owen Weatherhall. You know how many people don't know that the jackalope isn't real? The jackalope's not real. This book is on Amazon. It was like less than $20. The audiobook is available. It was like less than seven hours. Mm -hmm. Anyways, if you've gotten all the way to the end of this video, I love you, and I hope you have the best rest of your day, and uh, put a comment, and like, and subscribe, and I love you!